would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And I would like to add to that, I express my personal impatience for a treaty or treaties in order to try to repair some of the damage that has been done to the First Nations people. And until we have a treaty or treaties and we come to terms with our own past, I very much believe that this country is a bit stuck in its spirit and its soul. So I always like to put that uh, on the record at the start of the meeting. And uh, I salute those who are working to achieve that treaty or treaties on both sides of the ledger. It's not going to be easy and it will require a lot of uh, learning by everybody involved, but it's something I think we need to do and I think we're ready to do it. When we come to the topic at hand, um, I understand I've been given half an hour including questions, so I'm sure your questions are much more pertinent than my rant. And rather than assuming that I know what you want me to talk about, I'm very happy to be interrupted. And I see there's a question in the chat section already. Just to clarify, Peter, do you want me just to look at the chat section and read them out? Or are you going to read them out? Or how's that part of it work? Um, I, I think if you're able to do that. Which sure, sure. OK. Um, just to put a few things down, um, apparently it's, um, according to Laura Tingle on 7.30 last night, we're putting down markers about the ABC these days. So the last 24, 48 hours have seen some very interesting developments, which I think are emblematic of exactly where we're at with the ABC being an independent organisation in an era of an increasingly combative federal government. As the Morrison government enter what is next year an election year, they are very determined to try to um, manage the media, all of the media, as effectively as they can. There are parts of the media who are more than sympathetic to them and they don't need a lot of managing from the point of view of the Morrison government and I'm talking about the Murdoch media. And then there's the ABC, the former Fairfax newspapers, now called Nine newspapers, who are controlled now by the former television station Channel Nine, and they're going through an interesting time. Uh, there's Kerry Stokes, who runs Channel Seven and newspapers in Western Australia. And then SBS and The Guardian. Then there's social media. So media is more complicated than it used to be. The Morrison government is improving dramatically its management of the image of the Prime Minister and the presentation of him on social media and they're working over time to achieve a kind of avuncular um, friendly scomo that everyone can relate to the daggy dad as it's called a lot on Twitter. At the same time though they're deciding that the best way to approach a hostile in their view, ABC. I don't think the ABC is hostile to any government. I think the ABC is doing its job, which is to hold power to account whoever's in power. The Morrison government though regards the ABC as hostile and they are right now in the last 48 hours, they are doing what they can to try to um, rein in what in liberal party circles are seen as the excesses of the ABC News and Current Affairs Division. In so doing, the Morrison government are walking a tightrope, one that has been walked by previous conservative governments and even Labor governments too, it needs to be said, and state governments that have found the ABC getting up their nose from time to time of all persuasions too. The tightrope is that on the one hand, their constituents love the ABC, but the politicians hate the news and current affairs coverage of the ABC. They don't mind the documentaries. They don't mind some of the, the drama. They don't mind the kids. They don't mind the emergency warning systems and so on. But what they hate is the news and current affairs division because it's by and large um, genuinely independent of government. The Murdoch media is no longer independent of government. It's amply clear to anybody that's observing with their eyes open that the Murdoch government are now so partisan and such a cheer squad for the conservative side of politics in Australia that it's not even up for sensible debate. Uh, we don't need to waste time debating it. Anyone who's trying to debate that the, uh, the, the Murdoch government are not a cheer squad now for conservative politics in Australia are either willfully ignorant or not noticing. It's just beyond discussion. So then you have the other media. You have the, the, the long and proud tradition of what used to be the Fairfax newspapers. Uh, you have the ABC and SBS and so on, more recently Guardian and social media. Now the Morrison government can't control any of those, but what they can try to do is to control 
as much as possible their messaging. So why attack the ABC? In the last 24 hours, we've seen the minister in charge of communications, Paul Fletcher, a former Optus executive, and before that, a, a minder to previous ministers. We've seen him put a shot across the bows of not just the ABC, but the ABC board specifically over the Louise Milligan Four Corners called the Bonk Band Program. Now, that program, you can say you loved it, you can say you hated it, you can say it had flaws. Everyone has a different view of every program that the ABC puts to air on radio and television, online, on every platform. The reason that there's nine, now 100 participants joining in here is because you all have strong views. And I'll bet of the 100 people who are participating in this AGM right now, there's probably 95 divergent views of that Four Corners program, people who think it was you know, terrible to people who think it was excellent, people who think it could have done this, it could have done that. That's not the point. The point is that it's the, it's the output of an independent media organisation and it has its processes and it's not something that is controlled by or beholden to the government of the day. Um, we have those media outlets in dictatorships and we have them in third world countries and we have them in traditions other than ours, but we do not have them and we must never go down that path of having them in this country. So the, the letter that Paul Fletcher has sent, which as I read it, I thought, okay, this has been put together by a you know, middle ranking barrister pro bono, someone who's probably aspiring to pre-selection in the Liberal Party and thinks that they'll ingratiate themselves somehow to the, uh, the, the, the heavyweights in the Liberal Party by drafting out a kind of barrister's challenge letter that the minister then puts his signature to. I might be wrong, it's just a guess, but that's how it read to me. If you haven't seen the letter, I'll briefly summarise it. It lays out um, under the ABC Act, here are your obligations. Under the ABC Code, here are your obligations. Under the ABC Board Charter, here are your board obligations. I note that in public um, utterances, both the managing director and you, Ida Bartros have said that um, you previewed the program, the Four Corners program before it went to air and you approved its broadcast. Could you therefore explain one, two, three, four, five, and there's a cascade of questions there, all of which I'm sure will be very um, ably and I think quite simply answered by the ABC, um, the managing director and the chair of the board who will undoubtedly answer saying, first of all, the board don't make editorial decisions. Secondly, they're made independently and they should be made independently, both of the board and of the minister and of government and anybody else. Program makers are program makers and bureaucrats are bureaucrats and the two don't cross paths. Thirdly, it complied with guidelines. Fourthly, it picked on the Liberal Party, as Louise Milligan said in the preamble to the program, because they're the people in power. Personally, I think it would have been better if they broadened it out. There's plenty of ammunition there on that topic on other parties too, so why not include it? But they chose not to. That's, that's their prerogative as program makers. As I say, everyone will have made the program differently or will have a different critique of it, but that's not the point. The point is they made the program and they, it, it's undoubtedly compliant and it, def, it can be defended. Uh, there, there are shortcomings and you know people will quibble about it the letter will be responded to, but the letter and the content of the letter and the purpose of the letter is not to elicit an apology and a groveling back down by the ABC, because that's never going to happen. If the ABC do that, they may as well pack up and shut, shut down. They won't do it. The point is to put a shot across the bows of the board to try and get ITA and the other members of the board to be more muscular with management and to try and force management to be more muscular with executives who are then in turn forced to be more muscular with reporters and producers and presenters in order to try to just tip that pendulum a tiny little way. Can we just force the ABC somehow through a bit more pressure and public embarrassment to be a little gentler on us as we head towards a federal election year? That's all it's designed to do. And of course, as if you're following it closely, as you will have noticed today, the letter was followed up by a story given by Victorian Liberal Senator Sarah Henderson to the Murdoch media before the letter she sent to the ABC was even sent. It was, it was published and publicised by the Australian newspaper that Sarah Henderson was writing a letter to the ABC demanding to know if there were any private investigators used in the making of the Four Corners story, to which the answer already, within minutes, the answer was no, there aren't any, no, we don't use private investigators. There's no hint of it. It's a complete furphy. But meanwhile, the story is published. It's run, it gets a life of its own. And all the people who love those sorts of conspiracy theories will run off saying, oh, did you hear? 
the ABC might have used private investigators to try and keep government ministers under scrutiny. Well, BS, they didn't. But you plant the seed, you put the pressure on, you apply the blowtorch. So what we're going to see here is an ABC increasingly under scrutiny. Personally, um, I think to this audience, it will come as no great surprise. It's a massive mistake for the Morrison government to, um, to preach to, the, to their converted, to their crowd, to, to um, speak to their own choir and muscle up against the ABC because the ABC for swinging voters and for everybody else, other than you know, signed on, welded on members of the coalition uh, cheer squad, the ABC is beyond reproach. The ABC is the most trusted brand. The ABC is where you turn to when there's COVID, when there's bushfires, when there's emergencies. So to try and bash up the ABC during election year, to think that that's going to actually improve anything for you is pointless. Um, it's in fact, I'd argue further, it's counterproductive, but that seems to be what they're planning on doing. So it's interesting to see just even, you know, long ago, you invited me to speak at your AGM. None of us knew that this was going to come along. Uh, there is, in a snapshot, there's an example of why this stuff matters. So what's the role for friends of the ABC? Increasingly, in this incredibly hostile environment, incredibly um, combative media environment that we're in, there's a genuine need for an independent organisation like yours to speak up and be ready to come to the defence of an organisation that is a little hamstrung in speaking in its own defence sometimes. It used to drive me nuts when I was there for the nearly 30 years that I was, 23 of them on the radio in Melbourne on a uh, Monday to Friday. Um, but four years with Radio National, two years with 3LO before that, a year with investigators on ABC TV and other things. So in my 30 years at the ABC, it used to drive me nuts. And I used to say to anyone who'd listen, including managing directors, we're really good at telling other people's stories. Why are we so terrible at telling our own? Why can't we be better at telling the ABC's story? Because it is a good story. No, the ABC is not perfect. I'm the most passionate supporter of the ABC will not argue that it's perfect. I've devoted 30 years of my working life to the ABC and I don't think it's perfect. We used to, I think I wrote this in the paper, we used to play a game sometimes over lunch. If I was in charge for just one day, what would I do? And everyone would have a different view. But even though it's not perfect and it never will be perfect, it's worth fighting for, absolutely. And any attempt to dilute the independence of the ABC has to be met with stiff resistance, which is where the friends come in. Because the ABC is a little hamstrung in leaping to its own defence. It's obviously self-interested in doing so. So it's very important that there are other voices that say what needs to be said. So there's now a fairly new group, which is the ABC alumni, uh, which I, I'm, I'm a member of, but I'm not taking a leading role in for reasons to do with my own um, process of disengagement from the ABC. And I, I'm not having a lot to do with the ABC because it's good for me to let go. But I'm very supportive and, you know, at various times I'll do things with them, but it's really, you know, not something I want to devote a lot of time and energy to. Otherwise, you know, if I'm going to do that, I may as well have kept working there, quite frankly. Um, but the alumni are important. The Friends of the ABC are important, both state by state and nationally. And then other important contributions will come from organisations that are fighting similar fights, for instance, for a genuinely independent anti-corruption body in Australia. Uh, the, the fact that we don't have one is just beyond belief. And, and yet the, the model that the government's putting forward is kind of, you know, half horse, half camel, and obviously designed specifically not to be particularly effective, uh, which is a good way of making sure it, it, it doesn't get to any of your friends, but hopefully, you know, um, put a bit of distance between the people you're looking after and the organisation that you're being forced to create, the anti-corruption body. So some of these organisations, Transparency International, the Commission of Jurists, the Law Societies and Institutes, which are all motivated by similar things. There's lots of free speech organisations, Liberty Victoria and so on. It's really important that you all fire up and that you all speak uh, coherently, consistently with one voice that you compare notes with each other and help each other in doing that, that vital job of trying to uh, make sure that we have an independent ABC and a well-resourced ABC to hold people in power to account. So there's a bit of a rant from me. I've gone on for about 15 minutes, which is probably too much. It's 
I didn't end up talking about what I was going to talk about because these recent events I thought were so important they were worth concentrating on instead. And they are, they are going to be, you know, uh, I'll predict if, if the Labor Party have got half a brain, and I, I must say sometimes I, I do wonder, um, but if they have half a strategic brain, they will campaign on superannuation reforms. You know, I mean, if you, if you want to lay down the template for the next federal election, um, the campaign on home ownership, well, you don't have to destroy superannuation to improve the prospect of home ownership. In fact, the first thing you do if you want to improve the capacity for young people to get into the housing market is kill negative gearing. So that, dare I say it, many of the people who are participating in this session, including ourselves, people at my stage of life, who can go along to an auction and compete against our own kids and have a taxpayer funded subsidy on our side against them. It's crazy. If the Labor Party want to campaign on, you don't campaign on super, you campaign on home ownership and you say, yeah, okay, we went too far last time around, but we still have to make that reform. They got this close, but it still has to be done. If you're going to, if you're serious about improving home ownership prospects, you don't do it by ruining Australia's world-class retirement savings program. You retain it and you deal with the other real problem, which is that first homeowners are competing against investors and it's an unfair competition. The next thing they campaign on is an anti-corruption commission because people are absolutely fed up on that. And then the third thing they campaign on, I think, is the ABC. And if the government, if the coalition want to make the ABC something that's contested in the election campaign, well, the Labor Party should say, bring it on, please, because that's one we will win every time. So we'll see. We'll see how smart they are and how strategic they are. We'll see whether I called... Um, Anthony Albanese in my column in the paper the other week, I called him Albo Beasley, because I think there's a, there's a fair chance that he's kind of turning into Kim Beasley, who's you know, regarded as a genuinely nice guy, but not particularly, you know, you've got to have a bit of mongrel to be a political leader and never showed it. And I'm not sure Albo's showing any mongrel either. So we'll see what comes up and whether or not we have a genuine contest as um, we head to the first, first post COVID federal election. The risk of course is that as we've seen with many other countries, that uh, while the weather is warm and people are assembling outdoors a lot over summer, you will have COVID under control. But as we get to next winter, there are big alarm bells as we're seeing what's happened in other countries. And I don't think ScoMo will be too happy going to an election if there's more COVID around, because by then everyone will say, well, hang on, how did you let that happen? So it'll be really interesting to watch all of that as the election year cult uh, rolls around. So I'll, I'll invite your questions. There's seven there in the chat section. I'll have a look at those. I'll look at them now, but if you've got more, throw them in and I'll try and deal with them as best as I can. Uh, Carl has said, I was quite alarmed when Fairfax was taken over by nine, but so far nine seems to have maintained the standards and independence of Fairfax. What's your assessment of the takeover? Well, we've got a departure at the top of Nine Media. Um, I'm speaking to you and disclosing that I am a regular columnist for The Age newspaper and occasionally they run that in the Sydney Morning Herald as well. So I have a, um, I have a dog in that fight. I don't think I ever met Hugh Marks or interviewed Hugh Marks. Um, I think the circumstances of his departure are unfortunate. Um, I've got a slightly different view if people are having consenting relationships in the workplace. Um, I met my wife through work um, if the current sorts of rules existed, maybe we wouldn't have been allowed to engage in a romance. Um, one of our sons has met his partner through their work. I mean, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't stop people from romancing in the workplace. All you have to do is make sure everyone discloses. If Mr. Marx's problem was he didn't disclose that it was going on, well, that's different and it's got to be dealt with. But from the point of view of the newspapers, uh, in the same way as in all my years at the ABC, Never had anyone tell me what I had to say or couldn't say. And likewise, I've not had anyone at the, uh, at the age say, oh, we don't like this, we don't like that. Uh, the process is really simple uh, to your question. I send an email two days ahead to the opinion editor. I say, here's what I thought I'd write about. I can write about A, B or C, one, two, three. Here's, you know, uh, an idea. It's like, you know, a paragraph on what I would say in each one. And then that person says, oh yeah, do number two or do number three. Or no, we've got someone else doing one of those. Do one of these instead. And then I just submit it and then they come back and say, oh, the lawyers don't like that bit in paragraph two or whatever it might be. But other than that, no, there's, there's no censorship. There's no management. There's no massaging. You're left independent. And so far, uh, you know, that seems to be 
an ongoing tradition with the nine newspapers. Uh, Vera says, so concerned there'll be two new ABC board members appointed by this government, but uh, I think all the board have been appointed by a conservative government from Turnbull onwards. So uh, I might say, you know, I worked at the ABC when uh, Janet Albrechtson and Michael Kroger were both on the board of the ABC, when the chair of the board was hostile and still Morris Newman was the chair of the board and writes venomous pieces in the opinion pages of The Australian about the ABC that he used to chair. Uh, and Michael Kroger wrote a piece, my old law school mate um, from Monash Law School, uh, Kroger wrote a piece the other day saying, oh, the ABC board, ah, oh, you know, I was on that board. We couldn't, we couldn't change the culture of the ABC at all. Give up, forget it. Which was like Michael Kroger writing a piece saying, I failed. Hi, I failed. I didn't, I didn't achieve anything, which I thought was kind of curious. He actually did achieve some very good things. He pointed out to the ABC that it was not doing enough about business news, which was something he personally addressed. And, and you know, you've got much better coverage of business, which is a really important part of Australian life uh, and, and the economy. So, you know, he, made, he achieved quite a few things. So I don't know why he was so down. I think it's just, you know, it's part of the part of the house style in the Australian to bag the ABC. But um, no, ABC board members are in charge of everything except the output. You know, they're in charge of where the money gets directed, when buildings get acquired or, or sold, and major projects and, you know, technological platforms and so on. So, you know, you've got some really smart people on the board and they're doing what boards do, which is not being in charge of day-to-day -day output. They have nothing to do with the output, the day-to-day -day output. It's irrelevant to them. Uh, it's not their job to get involved in it. So appointing people, this government appointing to people to the board, you know, on, on one level, as long as they care about public broadcasting, I mean, you know, Ida Butros is turning out to be a great champion for the ABC. She was appointed by this government. So, you know, it's a bit like judges. When judges are appointed, politicians appoint judges who they think will reflect their own, you know, cultural views. Sometimes the judges, gee, what? Guess what? They turn out to be genuinely independent. They don't do what people thought. And it's the same with board members. So I don't share your concern. Uh, there are rumours News Corp and Foxtel are in big trouble financially in Australia, says Sally uh, Mosby. Are there any thoughts on this? Uh, they're not just rumours, Sally. It's, uh, it's confirmed. They're losing money hand over fist. The Australian's been a vanity project for Rupert personally for a very long time. It's the single biggest loss maker in his empire, both the previous version of his empire and this version. Um, the Australian is run at a loss because it gives them power and influence. Full stop. Nothing more needs to be said. Uh, Fox tells because of the sport shutdown this year, they've had a disastrous time. Cable television's on the on the wane because of all the streaming services. Um, I mean, you know, we've got this half-assed NBN because it was basically, you know, the NBN was concocted to try and protect Rupert's investment in cable. Um, you know, we're, we're paying a huge price, a huge price as a nation for trying to dance between some of the vested interests in this space and. Yeah, what happens? I mean, for years, people, media observers and analysts have been predicting that, you know, within minutes of Rupert Murdoch dying, when inevitably he does, he's nearly 90. Uh, although his mother showed the, you know, the very good genes there. Um, whenever it is, you know, no one lives forever, not even Rupert Murdoch, but um, anybody else who's in charge of that organisation will probably not protect the Australian, because I remind you, of all the newspapers Rupert's owned all around the world, there's only one that he started from scratch and that's the Australian. And he, he loves it like a baby, he protects it. Uh, Jenny Stewart, uh, now the Brereton report's been released, should we view the raid on the ABC and the threat along with the subsequent withdrawal of charges against Dan Oaks differently? In hindsight, the political affairs which led to the AFP involvement could be seen as an attempt to cover up these alleged atrocities, shame on those members of government. Um, well, what you're suggesting there, Jenny, is that there's a link between the politicians and the law enforcement agencies. And if anyone proved that link, that would be a massive scandal. But um, in the same way as we wonder why the federal police are so determined to pursue Bernard Kaleri and Witness K over the Timor Gap betrayal of the Timorese that Alexander Downer was in the thick of and all of these other things. Um, there's supposed to be a separation of powers, the independence of the law enforcement agencies from their political masters. Um, any suggestion to the contrary is to be treated very seriously, but you will need very good evidence if you're going to try and draw that link. Uh, Marcus May says, considering the joint power of government, News Corp and the IPA, 
Ah, oh, the IPA. To influence policy and public opinion, is the ABC's future doomed to become a rural media operation, areas where no profit can be made if the government cannot be changed? No, Marcus, it's not. It absolutely isn't. Um, the IPA actually hasn't got a lot of influence, and the Murdoch media's influence is on the wane. At the moment, they're doing very well. But riddle me this, Dan Andrews has been twice elected, and Anastasia Palaszczuk in Queensland just recently re-elected completely in defiance of screeching and screaming headlines in the tabloids in both Brisbane in her case and here in Melbourne in two elections in a row in Dan Andrews case. And likewise, the Premier here has soaring approval ratings despite a daily barrage from not just the Herald Sun, but also the Australian, which was supposed to bring him to his knees and you know have him capitulating to their, bending to their will hasn't worked. So I think there's an exaggeration of how much power they've got. And the IPA likewise, they've got some influence, but I don't believe they've got power. Um, part of the problem, and I'm, I'm to blame here, um, I, I, I've done two terrible things in my time on ABC Radio Melbourne. I picked up a, a obscure newspaper columnist in the Herald Sun and gave him a gig on the radio. His name's Andrew Bolt. And I picked up a obscure lobbyist who was a aspiring liberal politicians, a liberal politician who wanted it to get pre-selection, and I gave him a gig on the Friday Wrap. His name was John Roskam from the IPA. Um, both Bolt and Roskam both got a go on my program when they were virtually unknowns, um, because I believed in the contest of ideas, and I still do. So my attitude is: yes, you get a Roskam in, you get a Bolt in, and you challenge them, and you butt heads and you, you have the argument, hopefully you win the argument. And if you can't win the argument, well, you're not much good. But you don't shy away from it. You don't suppress it. You don't pretend it hasn't happened. And I think there's an um, enormous amount of money being put into the IPA and no one's allowed to know where it's from. Apparently, it's some sort of massive secret. It's like Harry Potter and the cloak of invisibility. You're not allowed to know where the IPA gets its funding from. The only reason that's ever been posited from uh, Roskam is because they're worried about blowback upon the people who put the money in. It's widely reputed to be Gina Reinhart principally, along with some other mining interests. That's probably true. If you have a look at the projects they do, big tobacco mining, all those sorts of things. I mean, basically, you know, they are a proudly conservative out there. They say libertarian, I say ultra conservative organisation. Um, you look at some of the, you know, um, barely out of short pants, kind of experts that they pop out from time to time. I mean, the job of people who don't like what they say is to challenge what they've got to say and outthink them. And, you know, give people a reason to understand that they're not right. So I don't accept they've got that much power and I don't think the ABC is doomed. But again, I say the ABC has to do a better job of its principal charter obligations and it has to tell its own story better and not be cowed into or shy from telling its own story. I'm going over time. How does ABC Friends harness the energy and networks of the many young people who watch, listen, love the ABC, says Jennifer Lord. Not visible here today, no offence to fellow members. Oh, <laughs> dear idea. Um, yeah, look, it's one of the features of Triple J, for instance, it almost never says that it's part of the ABC because it thinks that that's something that frightens people off. Um, and I think the ABC has to address it. It's trying to. It's doing much better on diversity, both on screen and on radio. Um, not always successfully, but they're at least making contributions to it. The ABC has to reflect the community in a much better way than it ever has in the past. And that also includes age. Um, one of the reasons I left is because I felt there were, you know, too many stale pale males. And uh, if I move, that makes room for Virginia to come in, which makes room for you know, Lisa Miller to come into News Breakfast, which made room for someone else where she used to be. And that generational change, Barry Cassidy and I did a thing together about that. That generational change is really important. And I'd like to see the ABC do some more of it. And there's some other long-standing people. I mean, how long does Macca stay on air for, for God's sake? You know, I mean, I personally can't bear listening to him, but, you know, no one owns a time slot and people need to be moved on. There used to be a saying when I worked at Radio National, there won't be any change till there's a few funerals around here. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with saying to people, you know, you've had a good run, piss off, let someone else have a go. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's strong management to do so. And I think that should be encouraged. Um, you probably want me to stop. Bluey appeals to the young and old, true. Uh, Sammy Jay, a worthy successor to Red Simons. I couldn't possibly comment on Red, but I'll comment <laughs> on Sammy. And 
Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's a great guy. Um, does the board ever object to budget cuts to the ABC? Yes, they have. Ida has written public, she's released public correspondence about it. Um, and uh, I understand there's a view in the board that the best way to secure better funding for the ABC is not by using a megaphone, but by speaking quietly behind the scenes. Personally, I think that's wrong, but that's their view. They have addressed it. That's the strategy they've adopted. It's not that they haven't turned their minds to it. It's just they've adopted a strategy of not trying to browbeat or confront the government. Um, that, that, that's, their, that's their business. Uh, I'm not on the board of the ABC and I never will be, but it's not how I'd do it if I was, I might say. Uh, and what's your view, last one from Marcus May, what's your view of the Federal Police dropping the Angus Taylor Sydney Council transport fake statement? How could the AFP seriously state it isn't worth pursuing? Uh, look, I wrote in the Age the other day, there are six ministers in the current Morrison government who should have been sacked or at least demoted. Uh, and my observation was that his failure to deal with them weakens his prime ministership, whereas Dan Andrews getting rid of Robin Scott at Somurek and Jenny McCarkos strengthens his leadership. Uh, so I refer you to my age article. There you are. There's a bit of cross promotion uh, on that very topic. So, uh, look, I've gone way over time and I'm sure you're all sick of me and you want to get on to other things in your important AGM. But um, just in concluding, uh, I salute you all for the work that you do. It is important. It is worthwhile. Uh, and on many, many levels, on many, many levels. And um, from the point of view of someone who worked in there, it was always lovely, despite the occasional nutters, critics, um, uh, sometimes deliberately mendacious criticism coming from rival media outlets, sometimes entirely motivated by self-interest. Um, it was always good to know that there were people who understood why we were there and supported the staff. And, and I repeat, the, the ABC only survives on the unpaid overtime of the staff. It is extraordinary how hard people work and how little people understand. I had lunch with my former producers today. I met up with Katrina and Matilda and Jules. And um, Jules told me, and this is a woman who's worked, being panel operator now for years at the ABC. Jules told me, I, I hope I don't embarrass her by saying this, sorry. One of my former colleagues said over lunch that she saw the ad for people to work in hotel quarantine for $85,000 a year, basically sitting on a chair and ticking names off and on a list and keeping an eye on people. And she said, you know, I would get a substantial pay rise if I resigned from the ABC and went to do that job. Isn't that sad? And that's someone who's qualified in sound engineering without whom programs can't go to air, who works really hard and I know how hard she works. She also works on the websites. She works on moderating the, the guest book, um, little FaceTime live and YouTube videos and all the stuff that you're seeing now coming out on the dis different panel, different platforms. Um, one of those key people who is cross-disciplinary, multi-skilled and massively underpaid. So I'll leave you with that thought. So thank you for the work that you all do. It's been lovely of you to invite me and I hope your AGM goes well and look forward to hearing more from friends of the ABC all the way into the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Uh, from all of us, thank you for a great career. Thank you for, for your ongoing concern and many thanks for talking with us today. It's my absolute pleasure and um, good luck. I'll, I'll leave your meeting and thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye. Yeah,